And thanks, Devraj, for asking me to give this talk. All right, so the motivation is as follows. Uh, in Rn, well, forget in Rn, for smooth manifolds, it's easy to come up with compact examples, right? You just take the circle, x squared plus y squared equals 1 in R2. This is a compact submanifold of R2, yeah? Unfortunately, if you try to do the same thing in C2, for instance, the same thing, does not quite work. It gives you a complex submanifold, all right, but it's not compact. And this is a more general phenomenon. In CN, there are no compact complex submanifolds. Yeah? So a natural question is, uh, how do you come up with examples? Uh, the, the most natural ways to come up with examples are quotients. So this one. Or, for instance, a complex torus, right? These two are examples of compact. They're diff this is diffeomorphic, of course, too. Right? So these two are examples of compact complex manifolds. Now here, if, if uh, one has a few examples of compact complex manifolds, one can produce lots of other examples, at least potentially produce lots of examples, by considering closed submanifolds of these. Yeah? So there are several submanifolds of this. So Drawer told me that he did examples of these, nonetheless. So what's a simple example? So, uh, so the standard notation for equivalence classes here is this. So how does one produce examples of submanifolds? Well, for instance, you can just take x0 to be equal to 0. So this subset over here is a submanifold. More generally, for instance, you can take a bunch of complex numbers, set this to 0. This is a submanifold. Even more generally, you can take a homogeneous polynomial. Homogeneous. What that means is this equals lambda raised to d. Yeah. So you take a homogeneous polynomial, set it to 0. That defines a well-defined subset of this object. And that subset is a submanifold under certain additional conditions. I mean, in this case, for instance, if if these partial derivatives don't vanish on the zero set, then indeed the zero set defines a submanifold of this. Even more generally, you can take a bunch of homogeneous polynomials, set them to zero, and if a similar derivative condition holds, you get a submanifold, right? So now we have lots of examples of submanifolds of CPN. So the next natural question is, so, so over here, this is, not, uh, this is not a very special situation. Any real manifold can be made to sit in Rn, right? We have the Whitney embedding theorem. So natural question then is, secretly, does, is every compact complex manifold secretly a submanifold of CPN. When I say submanifold, I mean closed submanifold. Okay. Akin to the Whitney embedding theorem, one could phrase this question. Unfortunately, the answer to this question is no. And the examples are, or rather the counterexamples are not very exotic. 
You take the humble torus, rather not the humble torus, a humble torus, take a random one, and here I mean genuinely random, just take a dart and throw it at the space of all tori, you will almost surely hit one that won't sit in CPN. So in other words, there are lots of things that don't sit in CPN. Well, that is somewhat disconcerting. Well, are there lots of things that do sit in C CPN other than the ones that you obviously produce like this? Well, all compact Riemann surfaces, namely complex manifolds of dimension one, are submanifolds of CPN. So in particular, by the way, so for n equals 1, these are all projective submanifolds. But for n larger than 1, you have problems. Okay? So, all right, so at least we do have several examples and counterexamples of this sort of a statement. So, at least do we have a characterization of all compact submanifolds of CPN? We do. Yes, so we have the Codera embedding theorem, which is what I'm going to talk about today, which tells us when you can embed something in CPN. Okay? So this is the motivation for what we are going to do. Oh, I have space there. Nonetheless, I'll just erase this. Right, right, right. Sure. Sorry. Uh -huh, that one. Okay. All right. So uh, before we state Kudera's embedding theorem, see, morally, you would like to think of these things as functions. So here is a sub question. Are the xi functions from CPN to C? Of course not, right? Obviously no. But are they functions from CPN to some other complex manifold? The answer to this is yes. Okay. So the the so xi's are actually honest holomorphic functions. They can be thought of rather. They can be thought of as holomorphic functions, uh, okay. the hyperplane bundle, uh, I will denote it by, have you used this notation? You haven't. So this is a very weird notation if you're seeing it for the first time, O1. What does a 1 stand for? What does O stand for? Well, let's just take it as something for the moment. Let me just recall the definition of this beast. So firstly, one defines a very natural line bundle over CPN. A natural line, why is this so whatever this is? So what is CPN? CPN is, as I said, it's the collection of lines through the origin. So what is a line bundle? It's a collection of one-dimensional vector spaces that varies holomorphically. So through every line, you have an obvious vector space, namely all the vectors pointing along that line, right? Namely, you take this subset of CPN cross CN plus 1, given by such that V is proportional to x, yeah? So this collection of, uh, so, so this subset is, is an honest line bundle over CPN, where the projection map is a projection to the first factor. I mean, set theoretically, at least, you can see that uh, the inverse image of every point consists of a vector space, yeah? So this line bundle, sometimes called the logic. This O1 line bundle is the dual of this. 
So what, what does that mean? At every point, the vector space consists, the, the vectors arising from here, they're all linear functionals on these lines. Yeah? So they're all linear functionals. Now, why, so they, these xi's are actually, they correspond to holomorphic sections of O1. Yeah? Why? Because if you give me xi, how does one produce a number given every, every vector? How do you produce a number? Just take the ith component and spit it out. That's a number, right? That's what a linear function is supposed to do. So indeed, at least morally, you can see at a set theoretic level that these are sections of this line bundle, right? All right. More generally, while I shan't prove any of these things, homogeneous polynomials of degree d give rise to and the converse holomorphic sections of O1 tensored with itself k times, or degree k times, k times, okay? In other words, if you give me a homogeneous polynomial, if you carry out the same sort of logic in your head, it's not hard to see that you do get a section of this, but it holds the other way around as well. That is, every holomorphic section, which is a priori something that locally looks like a power series, or arises as a, an algebraic object, a homogeneous polynomial. Okay, this is not obvious, requires some work. The, the, the key phrase here is Hartog's phenomenon, in case you want to look up the proof. Nonetheless, okay, so the bottom line here is, on CPN, you have lots of line bundles. They have lots of sections. Uh, we know all their sections. Yeah? Okay. Maybe I'll just... So, suppose, so to answer this question, let's try to figure out at least necessary conditions, if not sufficient. Uh, let M be a submanifold of CPM. Right? So what does that mean? You have the inclusion map from M to CPN, and that's a holomorphic embedding. Yeah? So what does the inclusion map? It's, it looks like this. Okay. Now, we'd love to say that these are all holomorphic functions, but they're not, right? They're not well-defined objects, really. However, we know what they are. They're not holomorphic functions to C, but they are holomorphic functions to this complex manifold. They're all sections of a line bundle, right? So these are all holomorphic sections of O1. Okay? You have O1 over it. Oh, by the way, just a word on notation. Why is the one playing a role here? Because, well, this is going to be called OK. Okay, the, one say, the one stands for you're taking a, a tensor product of the hyperplane line bundle with itself one time. Okay? I mean, that's not exactly what the one stands for, but let's pretend that's what it is. All right. So, we have a line bundle here, and the embedding seems to come from a bunch of sections, right? So this is a curious situation. You have a line bundle, you know all of its sections. Seemingly, 
the embedding arises from these sections. How exactly? Well, if you have a map between two complex manifolds and a line bundle over one of them, you can construct a line bundle over this, the pullback. So the pullback, yeah. uh, have you done the pullback? Yeah. Well, very quickly, how does it work? Well, if you've seen transition functions, namely a line bundle's picture should be thought of like this, a bunch of lines, except in certain regions you can have more than one line and they're identified by means of these so-called transition functions. And if you take a pullback, the transition functions of this chap are just pullbacks of the transition functions of these original ones. Okay? And these can be thought of as sections of the pulled back bundle. In other words, it appears as if so if M is a submanifold of CPN, so if M is a submanifold of CPN, then M has a line bundle over it. Having lots of sections, having lots of sections. Okay, what does this phrase mean? How many sections and so on? So we'll just uh, we'll just keep this phrase here and tell you what significance it has. Okay. Right. This is not an ordinary line bundle, it's not a run of the mill line bundle because this actually also has a metric, a naturally defined inner product. Why? This one has a naturally defined inner product, right? You can measure distances and angles in Cn plus 1. That induces 1 on its dual, okay? And it's, it's an inner product whose curvature is positive, right? This is related to the Fubini study metric on CPN. Yeah? So, so more precisely, necessary condition M well ought to have a positive line bundle. Yeah? Right. So what that means is that you have a metric. There exists a metric whose curvature is a Kähler form. So I'm guessing you did Kähler stuff, right? So this is a necessary condition. Okay? So the, the point of Codera's embedding theorem is that it's also sufficient. Okay? So the necessity is fairly straightforward. The point is a sufficiency. But by the way, this by itself should not be completely satisfactory the way it's stated, right? How does one verify this? If I give you an arbitrary manifold, how do you know if it has a positive line bundle or not? In particular, if I give you a Riemann surface, how does one know if you have a positive line bundle or not? If, we'll see if there is, if, if, I mean, time permits, I'll tell you how to verify this, at least for Riemann surfaces. But uh, take my word for it, it's not that bad. There are lots of ways of checking that condition. All right. So Codera's embedding theorem, uh, maybe the first version. First version. M is a can be embedded 
there exists an embedding f is an embedding if and only if there exists a line bundle on m with a metric whose curvature is a Kähler form. Okay. All right. So why did I call it the first version? We'll pr produce a more uh, a, a more precise version of this in a moment. So what is the embedding? I if I give you this, what is a potential candidate for such an embedding? First of all, uh, denote this vector space. This is the space of holomorphic sections. Oh, sorry, not x. I'm calling this m of L. The fact that this vector space is finite dimensional is not obvious, right? It's, it follows from some PDE theory, right? So this is finite dimensional. Uh, let's say its dimension of this is n plus 1, okay? So what you can try to do is the following. Let s naught, s1, Sn be a basis, right? So, and, and, okay. uh, let E alpha u alpha be local trivializations of L over M. Meaning that they're holomorphically varying families of bases, right? So in any local trivialization, a, a section is simply, it can be identified with a function where this is an honest holomorphic function to C, yeah? So, given this data, there is a potential candidate for such an embedding, and the candidate is as follows. So define, I'll put this in quotes, and you'll see in a moment as to why. on u alpha. Okay. So why is this in quotes? So there are several things that can go wrong here. Okay. First of all, I defined it locally, and that's a bad thing, right? What if I make different choices, what will happen? Okay. So if I change the local trivialization, what happens is each of these functions gets multiplied by a non-zero complex valued function, right? And that pulls out. It's the same function multiplying each of these, right? So this is, this is at least independent of what uh, local trivialization I use. That's point one. But still something can go wrong. What can go wrong is that all of these can be zero, in which case you don't have an, a point in CPN, right? What does CPN consist of? Non-zero complex vectors identified with each other, right? So two things that can go wrong. One of the things I've already got, uh, gotten rid of, the thing that can go wrong is, what if all SIs are zero? Okay, for some P. Sorry? Yes. 
Uh, right. Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. So for uh, so as Debrad said, first of all, I'm already assuming that there is at least one section. Otherwise, this this question doesn't even make sense, right? So already you see the relevance of this statement here. Having lots of sections is very important because a you want this to make sense. B you don't want this to make sense. I mean, you don't want this to happen, right? How does having lots of sections prevent this? Well, if for instance, if for every P and Q in M, there exists a holomorphic section such that S of P is non-zero and S of Q is zero, this is already too, this is too strong, but that already implies that this sort of a thing cannot happen. Yeah, I hope you can see why. Because, yeah, I mean, please think about this. This, yeah, so this already implies that uh, there exists at least one i so that s i of p is non-zero. Okay. So, so my point is if you have lots of sections, then this potential candidate is at least well defined. And if you have even more sections, then it can be an embedding. Okay, this is the idea. So you in some sense, we reduce our problem to be, to be able to construct sections of a line bundle with specified properties at points. Okay? So you can already see where Hermander's theorem will play a role here. Okay. So, but, but that's not all there is, right? Even if the map is well defined, So A, you want F to be well-defined, well-defined, that is, there exists a section S for every P such that S of P is not zero. The second thing is, want F to be one-to-one. -one. What that means is a, exactly the same as this. This is equivalent to saying, this is equivalent to saying, not equivalent. I mean, at least one direction is easy to see that if for every P and Q, there exists a section such that this is not zero and this is zero. This is one to one. Okay. We also want it to be uh, an immersion. Yeah, that is true. Uh, right. So what does this mean? So this means that you want to choose coordinates locally, and you want this to be one to one, right? The push forward, the derivative. So this one appears to be a formidable condition to check, right? How would you check it if I, if, if I ask you to check it, if I give you a map, what should you do? You should choose coordinates in the target, I mean in the base, and Let's assume without loss of generality that S0 is non-zero. So you take this bunch of things. So let's say this is F. And you want to take the derivative matrix of this and check if it has full rank, right? It seems like a formidable thing to check. Fortunately, this is implied by a slightly more reasonable condition. So claim, maybe I should call it a lemma, but 
given P not equal to Q in M, local trivializations uh, what am I calling these? Sorry. Uh, huh. Local trivializations and coordinates that I'll draw with pictures here on neighborhoods. Okay, the local trivialization here is E. Here it is E tilde. And here the coordinates are Z1, Zn, and the other one, these are W1 to Wn. And let's say P corresponds to Z being 0 and Q corresponds to W being 0. Okay. So if you're given two points and local trivializations and coordinates around these points and And complex numbers A1, B1i, A2, these are complex numbers where i varies from 1 to n. Okay. There exists a holomorphic section S of L such that S. Uh, such that S restricted to U, P, is A1 plus B1 I Z I E, and S restricted to U, Q, is A2 plus B2 I E. Okay. So in other words, simply put, you can find a section with prescribed first order Taylor expansions at two given points. If you manage to do this, first of all, sorry, the claim is given these, if there exists such things, ah, uh, I backed myself into a corner literally, down, yeah, then, so all of these things, then Codera's embedding is true. Theorem. Um, is true. Okay. So the claim, and I'm not saying this is immediate, if you can prove this, this property of the line bundle, then I claim you can prove Codera's embedding theorem. In other words, that this map F satisfies these three properties. Now it's obvious that the, it satisfies these two properties from that claim. The only thing that needs to be checked is this, okay? So I've done the calculation here. I'll put it up on my web page, but yeah, maybe I'll leave this as an exercise. Please try to check this. Namely, given this, prove that this is automatically satisfied. Okay. Uh, actually, oh, sorry. Yeah. So all right, so it turns out that this claim is not necessarily true in our case. Okay. Although we have reduced our problem to this, this is not necessarily true. What will be true, as we will find out soon, is, so just a spoiler alert, L in our problem, 
L may not satisfy this claim, satisfy the hypothesis of this claim. Okay. Which leads us to the second version of Kodera's embedding. Slightly more informative than the first version. Uh, so there I, I'll just state one direction because I've already done that here. If L satisfies this, there exists an integer k such that L tensor with itself k times induces an embedding into the space of sections. In other words, if you give me a holomorphic line bundle that has positive, a positively curved metric, that need not be enough. You might have to take its tensor product with itself uh, a, a bunch of times to make sure that the claim is met. Okay. So at least we have the full statement of Kodera embedding at hand. Okay? So the algorithm is clear. If you give me a line bundle L, I mean, it's not clear. The algorithm is not clear. But at, at the very least, we know that there is some integer k such that if you tensor it with itself a bunch of times, take the space of holomorphic sections, take a basis, then you can explicitly write down the embedding. Yeah. So just some terminology. Uh, OK, maybe I won't use the terminology of ample and very ample. It's not necessary for our purposes. OK, so as I said, the fact that this implies this is an exercise. These two are obvious, and this one requires a calculation. So we'll focus our energies on trying to prove uh, this claim, uh, pro trying to prove that L raised, L tensored with itself k times satisfies the hypotheses of this claim. Okay. okay. So suppose I do not put this restriction, if I don't put this adjective here, holomorphic, then this is a triviality. Why is it a triviality? Let's call, give these two things names. Let's call this u and this as v. There exists a smooth section satisfying these requirements. S tilde okay uh, maybe let me let me make this a little different where these are potentially smaller neighborhoods. And this is enough, actually. I'll modify my claim, sorry, u tilde p, where u tilde p and u tilde q are possibly slightly smaller neighborhoods. This is enough. Okay. This is trivial. Why? Because you can simply take s tilde to be rho 1 times u plus rho 2 times v, where rho 1 is a bump function. Let's say this is u tilde. I can make this 1 and 0 here. Likewise, I can take a bump function like this. Okay. So 
surely this is going to satisfy those requirements except for the fact that it is smooth. But it's not that bad because it's holomorphic at various places. It only fails to be holomorphic in this particular picture, in this annulus-like region. These are the only places where it fails to be, uh, where it, uh, yeah, fails to be holomorphic, right? So the idea here is to perturb it a little bit so that it becomes holomorphic everywhere. Okay? This perturbation cannot be done only in that annular, annular region. It has to be done everywhere. But the, the point is you should perturb it in such a way that its values here and here don't change. That's the real point. Yeah? This is enough. Is enough? This is, is this what we're going to get from the computation? Uh, I see, I see, I see your point. Sorry, maybe I should have uh, been a little careful. Thanks. But it's correct. Uh, what I should be saying, you're right, plus higher order terms. I see, you want to absorb them in here, but I want the trivializations to be fixed, I mean, in principle. If I give you the trivializations, then it's not. Yeah. Saying okay. those are global. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. S sorry. So I'm sorry. I'm mo modifying my fundamental claim several times. Uh, what I'm saying is, I'll firstly, this is not true on the nose. I'm allowing higher order terms. Okay. All I care about is that you give me the first order Taylor expansions near the, those points, and I'll produce a function section with those. Uh, with the given first order Taylor expansion. Okay, sorry. So this one uh, does satisfy that property, except it's not holomorphic, as measured by this quantity not being zero. Yeah. But oh, giving this a name here. Huh, this is eta. But this eta is not zero only in these annular regions, so to say, right? So ideally, we want, we want to solve eta equals del bar of something, the something, what is it? Okay, I'll call this t, such that t restricted to u tilde p is of order z square, and t restricted to u tilde q is of order w squared. Okay? So this is what we want to do. We have reduced it to a PDE problem, but it's a weird PDE problem, right? Normally PDE problems have boundary conditions, which are things like Dirichlet boundary conditions, right? On a boundary, you tell me what it is, but these are sort of pointwise boundary conditions and that two very weird ones. So how does one solve such a PDE? And herein lies the power of L2 techniques. So the thing is, here is where Hermander's theorem plays a role, which I'll state in this manner. Let m omega be a compact Taylor manifold. and L be a holomorphic line bundle with a smooth metric such that the Ricci curvature plus this is positive where C is a positive constant in case you're not comfortable with the Ricci curvature, 
Well, whatever this object is, as long as this is sufficiently positive, this condition will hold. This is all you need to know, okay? Then, for any L valued 0, 1 form alpha, such that del bar eta is 0, and sorry, del bar alpha, thanks, is finite, there I, actually why am I, no point in calling it alpha, there exists a smooth section of L such that del bar t is eta, and more importantly, and this is bounded. Okay. At the so oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, so this is Hermander's theorem. It solves a PD, the correct PD, but what it gives you is an L2 estimate. So how does an estimate help us conclude something point-wise? The rough idea is that not everything is square integrable, right? If, if you have something like 1 over mod z raised to a large power, let's say 5 times the dimension of the manifold, this is not an L2 of, let's say, Cn. I mean, sorry, L1, for instance. Okay? Not everything is in L2. So if I say something to the effect of this sort of a thing is in L1, let's say something like this. I'm, I'm being very sloppy here, intentionally. If I say this sort of a thing is in L1, that forces this function to vanish to a certain order, right? That is how we are going to meet those conditions. We are going to choose a clever, the, the, the cleverness lies in the choice of this metric H that in addition to satisfying these requirements is highly singular at those points. So that the fact that the section that you're getting from Hermander is in L2 directly implies this, these two conditions are met. Okay, so that is where all the magic is coming from. Okay, so let's do this or not depending on the time. Uh, okay, so first of all, what we'll do is we'll take L tensored with itself a bunch of times with a metric h tensored with itself a bunch of times. What is, which I'll call h raised to k, okay? What's the point of tensoring? Well, if you take the curvature, what's the curvature? It's del bar del log h, uh, local, yeah? Oh, del, bar. del bar del, right? So if I take this, this is k times the curvature of the original one. In other words, the point is, if you did not meet the positivity requirement already, if you multiply this with a large positive constant, surely you will re meet this requirement, right? That's where the k comes from. You can actually figure out what the value of the k is if you do these computations explicitly, so to say, okay? So we'll choose, we'll choose a large k as we go along the proof. We will choose k as we go along. Okay. All right, so, so this is not going to be our metric. Our metric is go going to be a sequence of metrics, e raised to minus psi epsilon. Notice if you give me a metric, first of all, this metric does not satisfy a crucial property that we require. Namely, it should be singular at those points. This sort of phenomenon should happen, right? This metric, the given one is smooth. It's not going to satisfy that requirement. So we will artificially introduce a new metric that does satisfy that requirement. 
Morally, what do I want to do? I want to simply do this, where psi looks like something like log mod z raised to where's this 2n plus 3 near p. And morally, it should look like this near q. The problem is these are not smooth, and that theorem applies only to smooth metrics, right? So that's why I want to smoothen them out. OK, let me give you the rough idea of the proof, and we try to make it rigorous. So if indeed we choose this, and magically if the conditions of the theorem are met, then we will end up producing a section T that satisfies this sort of a thing, right? is finite near p, and this is finite near q, near q. Now already you can see, this is a straightforward exercise to see that this happens precisely, not precisely, this implies that t vanishes up to the first order. Right? Why? Because say for the sake of argument, the zeroth order term is not zero. So t is, say, equal to 5 near, near p. Then you 5 divided by r raised to 2n plus 3, r raised to 2n minus 1 dr, this is infinite. Right? That's the problem. Right? Likewise, even if you have r here, even then it's infinite. Actually, you can clearly see that I could have chosen this power to be whatever I felt like, and I could have forced t to vanish to whatever order I wanted. Okay? The, the, this, the proof shows that it, it's something even stronger than what we need is true. Okay? So I hope at least the rough outline is clear before we, we don't have time to make it rigorous, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, so I guess maybe, maybe I won't bother making this rigorous. I'll just define this. And I'll, maybe the next time or some such thing, I'll try to, so the definition is as follows, where these two are bump functions, the same bump functions we defined earlier. The way you try to make this rigorous is, you produce a sequence of sections, one for each epsilon, and you try to prove that they converge in some sense. Okay? And the, converge, the limit to which they converge satisfies these properties. Okay? And therefore, t is 0 up to first order. And what happens then? Well, you can simply take s tilde minus t. This thing will be holomorphic, and it will satisfy whatever we want. right? Its first order Taylor expansion is exactly what we want. Yeah. Uh, I mean, here I'm already saying that the solution to this is smooth. There exists a smooth solution. So maybe I'll just stop here. We don't have enough time to go ahead.